اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم السلام علیکم و رحمت اللہ ویلکم سٹوڈنٹس تو دس فرس لیکچر آف دا تھرڈ ویک فار یور سبجیکٹ ایم ای ٹو زیرو نائن دیٹ از مٹیریل اینڈ میٹلرجی آئی ایم یور ٹیچر سید محمد حسان لیاقت شوڈ یو ہیو اینی کوشچن آفٹر دس لیکچر یو کین ریچ می ایٹ دا فالوئنگ ای میل ایڈریس سو بفور اسٹارٹنگ اور دا مین ٹاپک ویل جسٹ گو تھرو دا کورس آؤٹ لائن فار دس ویک So as for your course plan, in this week we shall cover chapter number 4 of your book and that is Imperfection in Solids. The major topics of this chapter includes the classification of defects, types of point defects and their effects on material properties, dislocations, which is another type of the defect, kinetics of dislocation, dislocation interaction, significance of dislocation and material permanent deformation. So these are the main topics for this chapter. For this particular lecture, our, co our contents will include Introduction to Imperfection in Solids That what the imperfections actually are Types of imperfections or defects in solids So they both are synonyms, so you can either use imperfections or you can call defects in solids Point defects and its type, which is one of the type of the point defects The point defects and further types of the point defects and this special point defect that's called the impurity so impurities in solids so we will be, co we will be covering these topics in this lecture before moving ahead we will just try to create a brief link with uh, what you have studied before in chapter number one and chapter number three so initially you have studied about some fundamental chemistry of the materials so the purpose of that was to teach that how the small particles like electrons and protons present within the atom how the number of electrons or how the number of free electrons affect the property of any material as you know the more the number of free electrons are the, the more electrically conductive material is or the more uh, heat conductive material is and same as the case you have gone through this periodic table which helps you to navigate along the uh, all elements based on their physical and chemical properties and in the chapter number three you studied how the arrangement of atoms itself affect the material property in the previous chapter you studied about how the small particles within the atoms affect the property of the material and in chapter number three you studied how the atoms themselves affect the material property so you studied different crystal systems seven crystal systems you studied about the Bravius lattice and some common examples are the FCC, face centric cubic, VCC, body centric cubic and other systems, hexagonal systems and other system. And while discussing that you also studied some planes and direction. What one of the main purpose of the planes and directions are is to help you to navigate within the crystal lattice. As you know each crystal lattice has a large number of unit cells. So these planes and directions helps you to navigate from one atom to another atom within the crystal lattice. Another term you have studied before that was the atomic packing factor. And that helps you to identify how much closely packed atom uh, the unit cell is. How much filled that unit cell is or, or you can inversely say how much empty that unit cell is. Why it is important to do to study that because the deformation of the material depends upon uh, the contacts of contact of atoms or uh, how much space does each atom have that when the material is deformed then it can be able to move in that vacant space so that's why it is important to study the atomic packing factor and other uh, such dense, density of the planes and directions if you now we will jump towards our chapter that is imperfection in solids so the myth that the existence of a perfect crystal it is a highly ideal thing which is not really the case most of the time if someone thinks that uh, more, that the materials we are encountering in our daily life they, are, they have the perfect crystal structure that's not really the case almost all of the material have the defects in their crystal structure 
even if you need to see those who the the places where we require some pure crystal structure even they don't claim to be have 100 percent pure material either they claim that they have the 99.99 percent of such and such material for that application even they they don't claim that they have the 100 percent perfect structure so the perfect crystal structure is highly ideal thing which is not really the case most of the time instead the various kind of defects exist in the crystal structure as you can see here and we will study that in our lecture ahead defects are generally considered to be something unwanted nobody wants a defect but in the injuring especially the metallurgy that's not always the case instead we sometimes uh, instead most of the time we intentionally produce the defects on our structure to get certain property out of that material to fashion a specific characteristic in that material why do we need to study about the imperfection in solids as you have discussed because it helps to modify the material properties uh, let's suppose in in these days in automobiles there's some common thing called the catalytic converter what is the catalytic converter it has certain defects on its surface right so the pollutant gases from the engine of the automobile they react with those defects and become either non polluting substance or the less polluting substance so that this is how it helps to reduce the pollution and in our, in our everyday life we have the impure substance you are dealing with let's suppose the common material is steel steel is an impure iron which has some carbon impurity in its structure right now the types of the defects we have four different kind of defects the first one it is called as a point defect that is also called as a zero dimensional defect then we have the second one that is called a linear defect it is also termed as a one dimensional defect then planar defect or the two dimensional defect and the bulk defect the three dimensional defect which is commonly we encounter in daily life like the cracks in our materials so starting with the first one that is the point defect what is a point defect defects associated with one or two atomic positions so defects associated with one or two atomic positions now keep in mind when you say one or two atomic position it doesn't mean that in the huge crystal lattice the defects will only exist at one or two atomic position instead it means that there will not be a consecutive defects in a single line or in a single plane instead we have the defects randomly distributed in the whole crystal structure that will turn as a point defect if we have the consecutive defects on the atomic sites then we will term this to be the uh, you can say linear defects or some other defects we will study that ahead so point defect is defect associated with one or two atomic position don't get confused we will discuss in a detail so you will have some clarity point defect includes the first one vacancy and self interstitial defect and second one as we uh, thought before that is impurities in the solids so starting with the vacancy or the self and the self interstitial defect what is a vacancy and the self interstitial defect it is the simplest type of defect in which an atom is missing from its lattice site that is normally occupied so let's suppose we have a simple cubic structure so these positions are termed as the lattice site or the atomic sites which are normally occupied so if an atom is missing from this position we will call that to be a vacancy defect and as we discussed before uh, perfect crystal is, is just a myth it doesn't really exist in, uh, in majority of the cases so all crystal and solids contain vacancy defects it is simply not possible to create a material that is point, free of the point defect at least point defects exist in almost every material so the presence of vacancies in the crystal increases the entropy you must have studied the entropy entropy people define as it is a disorder of a system it is a randomness in the system but uh, I, but people really explain that what the, what do they mean by the system so the presence of vacancies in the crystal increases the entropy 
means when there are there is a vacancy here it means we have more number of ways to arrange these atoms within the crystal structure right so what the entropy is it is just a number of ways we can arrange the energy within the system so the as the entropy increases we simply have the more number of ways to arrange the energy packets within the system so that's why if the vacancy increase we are simply more number of ways to arrange the atoms now this unit cell is completely filled it has no more ways to arrange the atoms right but if i remove one atom from here now we can move this atom at this position so there's one number of way to arrange the atoms or okay, i can just simply move this atom to this vacancy there's another way so just by imparting a one vacancy in this crystal structure we have simply increased its entropy that is we have more number of ways to arrange that atoms now how to calculate the number of vacancies in a crystal structure so at a equilibrium condition the equilibrium number of vacancies for a given material depends on and increases the temperature so it's primarily depends upon the temperature as well as some activation energy so that is equals to nv the equilibrium number of vacancy equals to n what is an n is total number of atomic sites and these are the atomic sites as i have told you before where the atoms normally exist into exponential of minus qv that is activation energy energy required for the formation of vacancy so the higher the it, it, it depends upon the material property it, it varies from material to material so higher the qv is higher the activation energy is the lower the vacancy will be at the given temperature so minus qv divided by k that is a boltzmann's constant for the gas into t that is absolute temperature in the kelvin so if you increase the temperature the vacancy will increase if you have the higher activation energy at the particular temperature then you will have simply the lower number of vacancies in your structure so graphically if you want to examine what the vacancy defect is so let's suppose we have the atoms it's a sim it's you can just say it's a front face of the simple cubic structure so we have atom range but one atom is missing from its side so we have the one missing atom and also it created creates some distortion of planes some distortion in the atomic order you can see they were arranged in a smooth fashion and just because of the vacancy they are experiencing some strain here at this point and same is the case here so this one is called as a vacancy defect now moving toward the self interstitial it is as the name suggests it is simply extra atom position between the atomic sites so you see there are some spaces between the atoms they are called as the interstitial sites they are called as the interstitial site these spaces between the atoms so if an foreign atoms or the, uh, uh, the atoms within the structure it is displaced and comes into this interstitial site that is called as a self interstitial because it is occupying the interstitial spaces from an atom from within its structure so that is it that's why it is called as the self interstitial so these are the two point defects we have discussed so the point defects the first one vacancy and the interstitial defect what is the vacancy defect it's simply the absence of an atom from a lattice site and these are the lattice site and what is the interstitial defect it is just a presence of an atom where it's, it shouldn't be there like it is occupying an interstitial spaces that is called as a self interstitial and it is called a self interstitial because this atom that is occupying the interstitial space that is from the same material that is from the same crystal because in this chapter ahead you will study another interstitial defect and that is because some foreign atom from atom from another material so that is why it is named as a self interstitial to differentiate from the other one so as as you have discussed already that if you increase the temperature here the vacancy will increase and if you have the high activation energy in this in this of the uh, form of the material then you will require more temperature to create the vacancy defect just have a go through from a 
solve example of your book that is 4.1 calculate the equilibrium number of vacancies per cubic meter for copper at 1000 degree centigrade the energy for vacancy formation is 0 0.9 electron volt per atom that is the value and the atomic that is the value of the activation energy the atomic weight and density at 1000 degree centigrade at 1000 degree centigrade for copper are 63.5 grams or more and 8.4 grams per centimeter cube respectively so these are the density atomic weight and the density of the copper so using the equation of that equilibrium number of vacancy in any material at a particular temperature we can find out that one but for that we need to find out this n and what was the n n was the number of atomic sites so first we will find out this n and we can use this uh, you can find out this by using the Avogadro's number that was the number of atoms in per mole of the material so that is equals to n equals to n a the Avogadro's number into the density of that material divided by atomic weight so we have 6.023 into 10 exponent 23 atoms per mole that is Avogadro's number into 8.4 grams per centimeter cube that is density and we have converted the density into meter cube per meter cube divide by the 63.5 grams per mole that is the atomic weight of the material so the total atomic sites in the copper having this atomic weight and this density is 8 into 10 power 28 atoms per meter cube in per meter cube in one meter cube of the copper we have 8 into 10 exponent 28 atoms or the lattice sites so to find out the number of vacancies in in this amount of the lattice sites at 1000 degree centigrade we will simply convert the 1000 degree centigrade into the Kelvin in the absolute temperature and using this formula n equals to n where n is this value exponent minus q q is the activation energy we have 0 0.9 electron volt per atom divided by k that is 8.6 to 10 exponent minus 5 that is, that is in the unit electron volt per kelvin multiply by absolute temperature so you can use by using the you can perform this by using the calculator so the total number of vacancies in the copper at 1000 degrees centigrade is 2.2 into 10 exponent 25 and it is in one meter cube of the copper And now the next type or uh, some specialized type of the point defect that is the impurities in the solids until now what we have been discussing uh, the type of the point defect that was uh, within the crystal structure either the atom was missing or there's an extra atom from the same material from the same crystal structure there was no foreign intervention intervention so for the second specialized type that is impurities in solids so pure metal consisting of any only one type of atoms isn't simply possible there will always be impurities in it so as we have discussed before that a perfect crystal doesn't really exist there will always be some defects so there's another thumb rule that pure metal doesn't really exist there are always some impurities in that and that impurities is because of the extraction and the solidification technique there are some impurities added into the material while extracting from the mines or while in within the purification process itself because the container carrying the material it might have some particles uh, it, uh, in it in the molten material so there are always some impurities in the crystal structure beside these in engineering application most of the time we intentionally add impurities in the material to impart certain properties we have discussed that before and such impure metals if you if if this impurities are particularly with the case of the metal such impure metals are commonly known as alloys so alloys are basically impure metals so the more generalized term that we use is the solid solution most generalized term that we use for the, such impure metals or the materials is the solid solution so we move ahead 
what the solid solution really is what is the solid solution when a foreign atom is introduced in the crystalline structure of a metal either of the two case occur so whenever any foreign atoms introduce into the crystalline structure either of the two cases occur the first case either that foreign atom react with the local atom and forms a compound known as the intermetallic compound so if the foreign atom is coming into the crystal structure either of the two cases occur the first case that foreign atom reacts with the local atom and forms a compound known as intermetallic compound so what happens when the material forms an intermetallic compound they have a different crystal structure than the original structure of the pure material so what the originally structure crystal structure was that foreign atoms comes in and react with the material and form the compound and disturb that original structure and instead form a new structure a new crystal structure and the second case is if the foreign material comes in as a solute and forms a mixture with the host solvent to form a solid solution so now we have two cases if the foreign atoms intervene into the crystal structure of the local atom either they will the foreign atom react with the local one they will form the intermetallic compound or it will just form a mixture with the local atom or the solvent atom it is called as the solid solution so solid solution has two subtypes first one is the substitution solid solution and second one is the interstitial solid solution by the way then what really are the alloys alloys are basically such solid solution alloys are basically such solid solution in which the host material the solvent material must be a metal alloys are not the intermetallic compound alloys are basically solid solution in which the solvent material or the host material must be a metal solute might be any non metal maybe carbon let's suppose the steel is an alloy of iron carbon in which the host or the solvent is the iron the crystal structure is of the iron and the carbon atoms comes in into the crystal structure of the iron as a solute so it makes up an alloy of steel so we have discussed two different cases when an impurity atoms comes into the host material so either they form the intermetallic compound or they form the solid solution so we'll just check graphically what is basically the difference between these two so on the left hand side you can see we have the intermetallic compound that is known as a cementite it is also called the iron carbide so it is basically a compound material of iron and the carbon atoms and its formula is fe3c right so in this material originally iron had a cubical structure but when carbon comes in it reacts with the iron and forms an intermetallic compound there are some reasons behind this why it reacted in this particular case but the original structure is not maintained rather we have some new crystal structure on in the case of the cementite or the iron carbide while in the right on the right hand side we have a substitution we have a solid solution of steel as a steel as you know steel is a mixture of iron and the carbon and to make it stainless we further add chromium atoms in it so we can see here the original cubical structure of iron is maintained so the carbon or the chromium impurity atoms they are not altering the original crystal structure of the iron rather they are forming either the substitution solid solution or the interstitial solid solution this one is a substitution one this one is the interstitial one and we will discuss in detail what they are in the next slide there is another term <clears throat> so this is the basic difference between these two you can see here there is an alteration in the crystal structure and there is no alteration in the crystal structure original crystal structure is maintained and there is no disturbance in that rather it is either substituting the uh, host atom or the foreign atom comes in and fills the vacant spaces there is another term that is called as a matrix matrix is just another word for the solvent material whenever we make an alloy or even the composite material there are two different kinds of material the first one the original the parent material and and the second one the impurity we add into in that material to fashion certain properties or the certain characteristics so the parent material that is bulk material that is known as a matrix 
and the impurities we add into that material that is known as a reinforcement because the primary purpose of that material is to reinforce to increase the strength in different aspects of that material so these both will be considered as a reinforcement for this matrix right so the matrix is the iron here and that is the solute material and they both are the solute material the impurity atoms right so now discussing the types of the solid solution we have the substitutional solid solution and the interstitial solid solution as I, I told you before why we call that why we name that as a self interstitial because we have another interstitial defect in our chapter just to differentiate that self interstitial with this one so starting with the substitution solid solution what is substitution solid solution in this type of solid solutions impurity atoms solute atoms impurity atoms which is a foreign atom which is also called as a solute atoms simply replaces or substitute the solvent atom from its lattice site right so what happens if you see here here so we just saw this figure before as you can see here in, in this crystal structure the crystal structure of the iron is basically the cubicle and the chromium atoms they are forming the substitution solid solution with the iron so the chromium atom just comes in and replaces the iron from its atomic side or the lattice side it is neither occupying any interstitial spaces nor making any bond with the original iron atom the host atom it is only replacing the atoms where the iron on only uh, occupying the spaces where originally the iron atom was before so now moving back to this slide for the substitution solid solution so there are certain factors that determine the degree to which solute material is soluble in the sol solid solute material is soluble in the solid material so what are those factors the first one is the atomic size factor for the appreciable quantity of solute material to be soluble in the solvent the difference of the atomic radii of two types of atoms that is the solute and solvent should be within the 15 percent that there shouldn't be a difference of more than 15 percent between the atomic radii of the solute or the solvent atom else solute will create the lattice distortion right and there's a likely there's a more likely chances the more chances that uh, it will not uh, create larger number of the solid solution like this one you can see here this is our crystal structure in 3d so the foreign atom just comes in and simply replaces the lighter blue local atom and substitute it from its position so that is a substitution solid solution what if the size of the foreign atom is greater so it creates creates some distortion in the structure as you can see here this larger green atom is pushing the adjacent atoms away causing the lattice strain you can see here in the larger view this purple atom within this structure is pushing the adjacent atoms away causing the lattice strain or the lattice distortion so the first point for producing a perfect or for producing a good amount of the substitution solid solution the first factor is the atomic size factor that the difference between the between the atomic radii of the solute and the solvent atom should be within the 15 percent second one is the crystal structure for appreciable solubility crystal structure of both metal types must be same both must have the similar crystal structure to produce a good solid solution at least from the same family if they both are from the cubic family then that will create a better solid solution than compared to if one has a cubical structure other has the hexagonal structure right then the third point is electronegativity if they have the greater electron affinity means one is more electron positive and one is more electronegative let's suppose the solute which is non-metal is more electropositive and the solvent which is metal is more electronegative then there's a strong chance instead of creating a producing a mixture they will react with each other and form a compound and that will become an intermetallic we have discussed that before 
and and what will happen in intermetallic a new crystal structure will form so it won't be a solid solution anymore it will be an intermetallic compound okay now the fourth factor that affects the degree to which the solid solid solution of uh, produces that is a valency a metal will have more tendency to do, and it's an empirical uh, observation what's empirical observation that uh, something which is obtained via the experimental uh, experience so a valency a metal will have more tendency to dissolve other metal if the solute metal has a higher valency than the solvent material right a metal will have more tendency to dissolve other metal if the solute metal has higher valency than the solid one so the factors we have studied before that is used to find out the degree to which the appreciable quantity of solid solution will form that is commonly known as the humor rothery rules so based on the humor rothery rules we will try to sort out this chart what it says which of these elements would you expect to form following with the copper part a a substitution solid solution having complete solubility part b a substitution solid solution of incomplete solubility and c an interstitial solid solution so for this lecture we'll be just focusing on the part one and for the rest of the one you can just have a try by yourself should you have any question you can just email me so it says which of the following will form a solid substitution substitution solid solution having complete solubility with the copper so we discussed the four factors the first one atomic radius of the solute and the solvent shouldn't have a difference of more than 15 degree 15 percent second one we discussed that they both should have the similar crystal structure and like there shouldn't be a difference between the electron negativity See, if they have the greater electron affinity they will react with each other and form a compound instead of a mixture of solid solution the last one the solute should have the greater valency than the solvent one so you can just find out in this chart which one has the nearest uh, atomic radius of the copper so we can have multiple answers that we have the nickel one we have also the iron we have the chromium we have the, uh, the these ones are three nearest possible materials and you can have some other one four one two five three cobalt as well as another but the second criteria was they should have the similar crystal structure so in among all this we can omit the chromium it has the bcc we can omit the iron it has the bcc also we only left with the nickel aluminium and the oh sorry nickel right and uh, only these two factors are contributing that nickel will be the most favorable for making a substitutional solid solution having complete solubility in copper if there's uh, another one with a similar uh, characteristics of the nickel we can move ahead with other factors as well we can we'll just go and check out the electron negativity and if that is also same we can just go to the fourth factor but if these two criteria gives a clear answer then that is enough for us that this nickel will form a completely soluble substitutional solid solution <coughs> now we have an interstitial solid solution the second part of the solid solution an interstitial solid solution in which an impurity atoms or the solute atoms fills the interstitial sites commonly known as the voids as you've discussed that before in each lattice we have some atomic sites in which the atoms normally exist and in between this these atoms there are some empty spaces they are called as the interstitial sites or commonly known as the voids compared to those atoms or the lattice side compared to those atoms on the lattice sites these interstitial sites are very small in size so the atomic diameter of solute atom must be substantially smaller than a solvent atom so in the case of the interstitial solid solution the solute atom must be smaller than the solvent atom while in the case of the substitution solid solution there should be similar there should be greater difference between them while in the interstitial solid solution we, 
the solid atom must be very smaller than the solvent atom so that it can fit into the interstitial spaces even very small solid atom is larger than the interstitial site La interstitial sites are so small even very small atom will be larger than the interstitial site of a common material so as a result they produce lattice strain on the adjacent atoms that's why when they comes into this interstitial site they pushes the adjacent atoms away causing the lattice strain or the lattice distortion so metals with a higher atomic pack factor means those metal in which the unit cell is densely packed they allow smaller size atoms for the solid solution they doesn't allow the large size atoms because they have the very small interstitial sites because they are very densely packed they have the high atomic packing factor <clears throat> owing to this normally the maximum allowable concentration of solute atom in interstitial solid solution is 10 percent so you will really uh, find any solid solution which is interstitial which has the concentration of foreign atom greater than 10 percent like in the case of the iron or steel in the steel which is an alloy uh, an interstitial solid solution of carbon with the iron so the maximum concentration of carbon you will find is 2.14 percent so you will see the details in chapter number 9 so we discuss about the interstitial sites so let's suppose we have a cubic unit cell so the spaces between these corners will be the interstitial sites and same the case we have the octahedral site interstitial site we have the tetrahedral interstitial site octahedral means it has the eight faces one two three four one two three four and these sites exist in the fcc bcc cubic cells and we will find out how do they exist here so they have a provision of one atom in between this whole triangle uh, for the foreign atoms to adjust in we have the tetrahedral site it has the four faces one two the back one three and the bottom one four or the triangular site like the triple one plane you have studied in the chapter number three so it has also some voids here an empty space here so the foreign atoms can come in and adjust here so how to find out these octahedral and the tetrahedral sites in the FCC cell so in the last slide we have seen different interstitial sites that are present in the unit cell we have seen the cubic site that has the largest vacant area for the impurity atoms we have seen the octahedral sites octahedral means it has the eight faces then we have uh, we, we saw tetrahedral site and which has the four faces and we have the triangular site that is triple one plane in a cubic unit cell as you must have seen in the last chapter number three <clears throat> so now we will try to find out the octahedral and the tetrahedral sites within the FC unit cell so let's start with it so we have the FCC unit cell here we have four corner atoms with the blue and the bottom four corner atoms here then we have the top face atom we have the bottom face atom and the four other face atom that are marked with the green <coughs> so now let's find out the octahedral site here first then we move towards the tetrahedral one so we start here with this one and what is the interstitial site it is basically the vacant space in the unit cell so the more densely packed any atom any unit cell is the less vacant space it will have as you must have studied this in the chapter number three that the FCC unit cell has uh, the greatest atomic packing factor so it means it is mostly its most uh, densely packed structure that's why it has a very small vacant space in it compared to the BCC cell or the simple unit cell so we have one atom here one here we simply combine it with this one combine it with this one this one and this one right we just join with this one this one this one and last this one and this one so 
so you can see here we have one space we have a vacant space for our impurity atom here this one is called the octahedral side we have, you can see it has the eight faces one two three four five six seven and the eight one and if an impurity atom comes in here and occupies this space then the, this unit cell will have that impurity atom completely you, means you will count that impurity atom equals to one because that impurity atom will not be shared with any other unit cell here now let's find out some other octahedral sites the other one we can have other one will be the shared one with other unit cell so we have this one sorry for the red one we have this I'm just extending the unit cell for your ease. Okay, that's the last one. So we have an atom like this is also. So this one, this one, and then an atom here. This one obviously we have already found this one. Now you can see some images coming up. Project it out first to find another unit cell here. So we must have another atom on this phase as well. So if something comes on, I'll just go. So you can see here we have another site for an impurity atom on this edge. So we have to find another octahedral site in the FCC unit cell. But you will see that if an impurity atom comes here and occupies this space, uh, it will be shared with different unit cell. It is not completely in a single unit cell. So it is shared with the unit cell number one, unit cell number two, unit cell number three, and there will be another unit cell number four here. Right? So we have plus one by four. So this is not a completely in a single unit cell, it is only one fourth in the single in this unit cell. Plus, it's shared with the other unit. So, simply you can find out another octahedral site here, here, and here. So, one by four into four, right? Plus, again, if you go to the bottom, you can simply again find out the sites here. Yeah, I'm making a small one just so it will easily identify here and on this edge. So again, they all are one fourth in this unit cell. So we have the one by fourth into four, right? So how much total interstitial octahedral site we have now? One plus one plus one. We have three. Now, according to the formula, we have four octahedral site in the FCC unit cell. So how can we find the fourth one? You can see here. It will be a bit messy but you uh, should, uh, should pay attention. So just let me see and verify that. If we extend our unit cell or the lattice right I'm just using some rough sketch here. And you will see we must we have a face atom here for this FCC cell, right? And we, we have another unit cell at the back. We have another unit cell at the back. cell also have an atom on this face, on this face, right? So we can easily identify our octahedral side now. And this one, this one, okay. and we have an atom here on this face, on this face, on this face, on this face. Right. So this is the bottom one. So 
now we have four different edges. Keep in mind, keep in focus the primary rings that we are uh, calculating the operator size for. So we have two, and again it is shared by four different cells. This one, cell number one, cell number two, then this is cell number three, and the back one, cell number four. So each interstitial side on these edges, these vertical edges, is also equals to one by two. And how much these sides we have? On this side one, on this side two, on the back one three, and on this back four. So we have this one equals to one by two. So all together we have four octahedral sides in the FCC units. So this is the problem 4.5 of a textbook that states for both FCC and the BCC crystal structure there are two different types of the interstitial sites. We have discussed octahedral and tetrahedral sites. In each case one side is larger than the other. In each case one side is larger than the other. Like in the case of the FCC the octahedral sites tends to be larger than the tetrahedral sites and is normally occupied by the impurity atoms. For FCC, this larger one is located at the center of each cell, each edge of the unit cell. It is termed as an octahedral interstitial site. As we have just drawn in the last slide, it says the lar this larger one, that is the octahedral one, is located at the center of each edge of this unit cell. This is the edge of the unit cell, so at the center of each edge of the unit cell. And we have just drawn the octahedral site in the last slide. It is termed as an octahedral site. On the other hand, with the BCC, the larger site type is found at 0, 1 by 2, 1 by 4 position. That is lying on the 100 planes family. What does it mean by 100 planes family? It means all the possible combination of 100, the planes included on the all the possible combinations. That is 100 plane or 001 plane or 010 plane, right? So all of these planes are included in the 100 family. And the largest site type in the BCC is found at this position 0, 1 by 2, 1 by 4. So on the x axis it is 0, on the y axis it is 1 by 2, on the z axis it is 1 by 4. So somewhere here in the BCC cell, this is the FCC one. In the next lecture we will draw for the BCC as well. For both FCC and the BCC crystal structure, compute the radius R for an impurity atom that will just fit into these sides in terms of the atomic radius R of the host atom. So what this, what he is asking here, if an impurity atom comes in into this site, so what is the appropriate size of this impurity atom? What is, should be the appropriate radius of this impurity atom? so that it just fits into this space. What does it mean by just fits into the space? So that it doesn't pushes these atoms away and causing a lattice strain. It just comes and fits into this space perfectly. So we just draw this face, this one. We just draw this face in the two dimensional here. So we have drawn this face in the two dimensional. The two edge corner atoms the two corner atoms, the two bottom atoms here, the two bottom atoms here and one atom at the center, one atom at the center. And it is says that the impurity atom has, is at the center of this edge of this unit cell. So we have the impurity atom at the center of this unit cell edge. So we have the capital radius R of this host atom, another capital radius R of the host atom and 2R for the diameter of this impurity atom. So R, capital R plus 2R, small r and the capital R. This all together makes an edge length that is equals to A and you have seen this before. So our aim is to find out the size of this small r in terms of capital R. So we'll just write the simple equation 2R would be equals to total edge length minus these two r's. So 2R of the smaller impurity atom equals to edge length minus the 2 into radius of the host atom. As we know in the FCC cell, an edge length is equals to 2R under root 2, where R is the radius of the host atom. So we just simply place these values in this equation. So R equals to A minus 2R by 2, and A is equals to 2R under root 2, so we have 
and impurity atom equals to 0.41 of R. So what is it states that in FCC cell, the largest available site for the interstitial solid solution, it has a space only less, uh, slightly less than the radius of the host atom. Slightly less than the half of the radius of the host atom. So you can see this much a smaller site is available only for the interstitial site. While if it was the substitution sort of solution, so we can just simply place an atom that is equals to R in the substitution one. Because in the substitution one, atom just comes in and replaces the local atom. While in the interstitial space, it has come, it has to come into this vacant space. And these vacant spaces are very small. As you can see here, that is 0.41 of R. So that is why in the interstitial sort of solution, the whole solute atoms tends to be very small. They must be very small to form a perfect interstitial solid solution. So this is the end of this lecture, number one of this week, and the chapter number four, imperfection in solid. So should you have any question regarding this lecture, you may contact me at my email address, sayinassan at the rate nadug.edu.pk. I have just shown you at the beginning of this lecture. So we discuss in this lecture some basic concept of what the imperfection and defects are and why the material tends to have the imperfection and defects. Some types that is the point defects, linear defects, planar and the poly defect. Then we discuss types of the point defect that were the vacancy and the self-interstitial and the other one is the impurity defect. Vacancy was simply the absence of the atom from a lattice site and self-interstitial is, is the presence of a local atom in the interstitial, interstitial spaces of the same lattice. While in the case of the impurity, there is a presence of the foreign atom in the crystal structure of the solvent material. And it can have both the cases, either it can have the substitution solid solution that the foreign atom is just replacing the local atom or it can have the interstitial solid solution, it is just making a uh, filling up the space of voids in the unit cell. So this was just a brief summary of today's lecture and thank you for your time and should you have any question you may contact me at my email address. Assalamu alaikum.